Uh, good morning, church. My name is Sonny Ryan, and you're going to want to turn my mic way, 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 way down. Because I am way, 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 way loud. Uh, but my name is Sonny Ryan, and uh, my wife and I just moved here about four weeks ago to start leading the family ministry. So, uh, so we're really excited about that. So grateful for Hans uh, giving a frustrated preacher an opportunity to preach. So uh, my wife and I moved here from Cleveland, Ohio, where we led the church for nine years. Uh, before that, we were in Lexington, Kentucky. We actually planted that church and started it from just a few handfuls of people and grew it. And we led that church for seven years. Uh, before that, we were in the ministry for a couple of years. Uh, so Kim and I are coming up almost 20 years in the ministry. And so, but we're grateful for a kind of a new adventure here in Denver building a family ministry. Amen? Uh, so this is kind of the Rhine clan here, just so you have an idea. Somewhere up there. In the cloud, there is a, there's supposed to be a picture right here. No? No? Oh, like I said, I don't need slides. Um, so my, there will be a, a, a picture of my family up there. Uh, but this morning I want to talk a little bit about your faith. But I want to talk about a couple things. One is I want to talk about God's promise and your faith. And so we're going to look at, oh, there it is. It's so pretty. Look at that. It's awesome. All is right with the world again. So, um, so my wife, Kim, my daughter, Ashlyn, and my, my son, Josiah. So we were, we're, we're super fired up to be here. Um, and if you would, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to talk a little bit about faith uh, this morning. We're going to talk about God's promise and our faith. Uh, we're going we're gonna to actually talk about Abraham, but we're actually going to start in a place we don't normally start. We're going to actually start in Genesis 11. Uh, Genesis 11 is a very interesting story. It's the story of the Tower of Babel, and we're going to read just a little, little bit of this. Um, it says, Genesis 11, verse 1, says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. You know, I love this passage because uh, this is kind of a bridge between the story of Noah and Abraham. And so we get this kind of situation because I've always wondered, like, why is the Tower of Babel in there? You ever wondered that? Like, there's this great narrative about how God redeemed the world in Noah, and then all of a sudden there's like, and they built a tower, and it went bad. And then there's like all these names, and we get to Abraham. But now I look at this, and it's very interesting, because the well, last time the people messed up was Noah, right? And when people messed up and they did their own thing, God brought, brought about judgment. It's very interesting, this time the people mess up, and God brings about a promise. And that's the promise that we see in Abraham. So this story is kind of a bridge between Noah and Abraham. It gives us an idea of a couple things. One is the people were told from Noah to go and fill the earth. Are you guys with me here? He says, go fill the earth. Go and keep going. And those people, what happens is they started going east. And they found this really great spot. Right? And there was water. And it was flat. And they thought, huh. We can keep going over the mountains, and we can keep trudging on, or we can just settle right here, where it's nice and flat, where there's plenty of water, where life is good. And so that's kind of the the parallel, because when we come to Abraham here in chapter 12, we're going to start here in verse 1. It says, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. You know, I love this aspect because we see here that there's a there's a great um, transition from the people stopping and and not fulfilling God's purposes for them, their lives. And the beginning of Abraham's promise was to go. And you know, this morning, we're going to choose if we're going to believe God's promises, that God has something amazing planned for us, and that we'll go and we'll follow God's way and God's path to get there, or we're going to find a way to kind of just make our lives comfortable 
And where we can kind of build a name for ourselves, we can build a family for ourselves, we can do those kind of things. And so this morning, I I, I want you to ask yourself, what is God's promise to you? And how do you know if you've really kind of fallen into this aspect of really God's plan for your life? Because, you know, I really believe that God's plan for your life is much greater than settling in the plains of life. A lot of us, we just want to get to a comfortable spot and then we're good. I remember when my kids were little, I just thought, if our kids can just go to school, right? Like, if they could just go to school, if they could do, just do this. And so, I, I don't know if you've ever, ever at this place where you're just like, if we could just retire, if I could just not go to work every day. If the kids could just leave the house forever and not come home. That, oh, oh, if we could just get there. I, I, don't, I, don't, know, I don't know if you're, if you're there, but what, what is next for you? If, if this, if we could just get here. And so... We, we kind of crave just this flat land where there's water and everything is good, where, where everything is just comfortable. And yet God is always calling us out of that. God is always calling us to something bigger and better in our lives than just comfort. Just a kind of a nice place to settle. Um, you know, I love it in Galatians chapter 3. You don't have to change there. You don't have to turn there. But God is going to just talk about this aspect of us who are in Christ. We're Abraham's heirs. Like, just like God called Abraham to go, are you with me here? He's calling us to go through Jesus. Like, as a matter of fact, when we become Christians, we become heirs with Abraham of the same promise that God gave Abraham. I'm going to give you a home that you know nothing about. It's going to be a long journey to get there, but I promise you that it'll be way better than anything you could have ever hoped for. Right? Right? And so when we look at Abraham, it's a great opportunity for us to look at our own faith and what Jesus is calling us to today. Now, here's the challenge. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but I'm I'm normally fired up. I'm a normally fired up kind of guy. But over the years, as I've gotten older, I've gotten less hair and more problems. Now, I don't know if that's proportional. I don't know if that's proportional, but it seems to me that as I've gotten older, I've gotten less hair and more problems. I don't know if that's true for you as far as at least the more problems part. But life tends to be more complicated. And we see the thing I love about Abraham is I think Abraham teaches us how to claim our promises from God. And the challenges that we have in keeping our faith as we journey to God's promise for our life. So let's let's look over here real quick. We're going to see like one of the first challenges is here, oops, I blacked those out, but they're back. Okay, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. We're going to see one of the first challenges to our faith. In Genesis 12, verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land. Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know, that, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. You know, first of all, this is a tip to all the husbands in the room. Okay, uh, Sarah is 65 at this point. And he looked at his wife and he's like, honey, honey. You are smoking hot. You are smoking hot. Like, you are so amazingly beautiful. Like, if I go in there, they're going to be like, what is she doing with this loser? And they're just going to kill me on the spot. Now, that's how we should always feel about our wives. You know what I'm saying? Like, my wife always, my my, my wife always hates it when I do this, but like, my wife is smoking hot. She's awesome. We always got to keep that in, in us. Amen. That's just a side note. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Amen. But we, we should keep that. But you know what's very interesting about Abraham? He's starting on his journey. And then the first thing that goes wrong is there's a famine. And it's not just a regular famine. It's a severe famine. And so when we start our walk with God or we might be studying the Bible or we, we come along to our first real challenge in our faith uh, or maybe our first real significant challenge in our faith. And then what happens is we have this tendency to play out the worst possible scenario in our minds. Are you guys with me here? Like, okay, if I stay faithful, what if this happens? Right? We can even do that when we study the Bible. If I become a Christian, what if this worst case scenario happens for me? Right? Now, let's just be really honest. 
There's a lot in between this aspect of he goes into Egypt, they see him, they think she's really hot, they kill him, the end of the story. Like, that's literally like the worst case scenario for Abraham, right? But his mind immediately went there. I'm going to walk in there. They're going to see she's hot. I'm dead. It's all over. Like, really, there's no in between. There's no you walk in there, you get food, you go home. The story continues. But how about us? Have you ever been in a situation where you were confronted with something? And instead of being faithful to go, God is going to be faithful to me. You thought about the worst possible scenario. You know, I think that that's that's challenging for our faith. And, and that's that's the one thing we have to understand is, is that our faith falters when we give in to fear. Our faith falters when we give in to fear. When we when we start being consumed with how scary the situation is, rather than how amazing our God is, we will always lose faith. We will always compromise. We will always have challenges. You know, what's very, very interesting is is this faith that he was supposed to have that he didn't have. Believe it or not, that compromise was going to cost him something. Because you see, faltering faith and fear flow to future generations. You know, it's very interesting that when Isaac... Uh, is going to go in, in, in Genesis 26. He's going to lie about his wife, Rebecca. Evidently, she was really hot, too. She was really beautiful. And he's going to lie about his wife. And you know what's really funny? Is it's going to get worse in the next generation. Because J- Jacob is going to be known as a deceiver. He's going to be known. And, you know, I think when we start living our lives based on fear rather than on faith, we teach that to our kids. We teach them how to compromise. We teach them how to live in fear rather than live in faith. You know, so if you're a parent this morning, what are you living by? Are you looking at the worst case scenario? We can't do this or we can't give that or we can't we can't we can't be as faithful as we need to be because we have this special circumstances. There's a famine in this area of our life. What they see you do is what they'll learn to do when they're older. Notice I didn't say what they hear you say. No, what they see you do is what they will do when they get older. I love John Louis. John Louis always said, he always said, dysfunction is the gift that keeps on giving. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Is there something in your family like a mom, a grandma, mom, you know, you or grandpa, dad, like whether it be alcoholism or worrying or whatever is there something in your family tree you can go, man, dysfunction is really the gift that keeps on giving. And that's why we have to make sure that we're living faithfully to God. Amen? The other thing that I think is very interesting is um, compromising convictions equals short-term improvement and long-term grief. I love this. He's like, okay, I just want to make sure I'm going to, I'm going to manipulate this situation so that in the short time things will go well. But in the long term, look at all the grief he went through with his kids because he taught them deceit and compromise was better than faith. Think about all the challenge he had with Isaac, all the challenges with Jacob, all the deception, all the, all the kind of conniving that kind of went on in that family because of this first compromise. Let's, let's continue looking at Abraham's faith here. I love here in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. Now, that's, that's pretty good advice now that we, he's already been afraid, right? I am your shield, your very great reward. Now, sometimes we read the Bible in sections. We don't know why God is saying that to somebody. He's saying that because you've got to have faith that I'm going to protect you, that I'm with you, that when, when, when you think the Egyptians might kill you because your wife is really smoking hot, don't worry. I'm your shield. Don't worry about a famine. I'm here. Are you guys with me here? But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is uh, Eleazar of uh, Damascus and Abram had... And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. You know, what's very interesting is 
God never loses vision for us. God never loses. Like God has this incredible plan for our life. And, and even if we get sidetracked, even if we give in to fear, like God's still trying to get us back on track so that we can get where he's trying to take us. But how about you? Do you really still believe, no matter how old you are, whether you're a teen or you're a campus student or you're really, really old? I mean mature. I meant mature. I meant to say mature. Mature, really, really mature. Experienced. Do you still believe that God has a plan for your life? Or do you think that ship has sailed? Is dreaming that God has something incredible in your life just for the young? It's just for the teens. Like, you know, Caden and Cam. Those guys, they got great futures. They got all this stuff ahead of them. But, but not for me because I'm, I'm a later in life. You know what's very interesting is, you know when God appeared to Abram? He was 75. I think that's, I think God's dream for us doesn't decrease as we get older. I think it increases as we get older. Are you guys with me here? I think sometimes we think dreaming and great plans is for the young and the campus and the teens, but it's not. It's for all of us. And we never outgrow God's plan for our life. We never get too old for it. And I love this. Here's what's very interesting is what happens next in Genesis 16. So this is what God tells him, and this is what happens. General, uh, Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant called Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. I'm just going to tell you something. Let let me save all of us some suspense. If you try to make anybody other than God happy with your life, you are going to be miserable. Have you ever tried to make somebody happy and you did exactly what they said and they still weren't happy? Your boss, your spouse, your kids, you can give your kids exactly what you want. And they're still like. (sighs) That's all you got. That's all you asked for. How many of us, we live in constant frustration because the person we're trying to please most is not God. You know, Abraham gets in this situation where it's not fear this time. It's like my wife is unhappy. And when your wife is unhappy, life tends to be unhappy. But rather than going, no, 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 sweetheart, we can't do that because I got to please God. I trust God is going to come through for us, babe. God is going to be there. He's going he's to do it. He goes, that make you happy? Yes. Okay. But it comes back to this again, doesn't it? Compromising your convictions equals short-term improvement and long-term grief. That turned around really quick, right? Like months. She was like, I'm happy. Yay, we have a plan. We're finally going to have expand our family. And then as soon as Hagar got pregnant, it was like, look what you did to me. You did this. That's, that's kind of how fleeting our compromises are, aren't they? When we, we're not faithful, when we don't give, when, we, when, we don't, when we're committed to the mission, when we, whenever it is, whatever compromise we make, you know, in the short term, I think that's what sometimes fools us, is in the short term, it seems that it does go better. I've had seen people like literally, they, they kind of fall away, they kind of like leave God, they kind of wander away from God, and they just, they, they, they say, I actually feel kind of better. And I'm like, yes, it's a short term improvement, because you're not feeling guilty. But in the long term, you're going to live in the darkness without God. You're going to be a victim of a dark world. And the grief that you're going to experience is unimaginable. Because we've got to remember that our, our compromising our convictions and our faith and believing in who God is and calling uh, God calling us to do what he asks us to do the way he asks us to do it, it's, it, it's going to lead to long-term grief if we, if we compromise. You know, I love Abraham because he is the father 
of the faithful. Literally, right? I mean, he's in the hall of faith. In Hebrews 11, we talk about the most faithful man who's ever lived. But you see that he didn't just develop faith like in a day. Are you with me here? The good thing is, is that we don't have to repeat all these mistakes that he made before he was faithful. We can actually learn from Abraham's mistakes or we're destined to repeat them. We're destined to live our lives in pleasing our wives and our kids and our bosses and being miserable. And seeing short-term improvement only to experience long-term grief. Let's, so, so let's look here in Genesis chapter 17. Verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm My covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations uh, uh, to generations. Excuse me. To, for the generations to come, to be your God and to be the God of the descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Now skip down to verse 17. This is, the, this is Abraham. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessings. Here's what's very interesting about this journey. Have you ever thought about this? When God first showed up to Abraham, he just said, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, like, lots of kids. You're going to be the father of many nations, right? Like, and so he didn't kind of elaborate. And then Abraham, is, he's struggling in his faith. He's trying to stay faithful to God. And then God's like, I'm going to make you as numerous as the stars in the sky. Are you guys with me here? And then he messes up again, and God goes, no, no, no. No, no, no. Now you're going to be the father of kings. You're going to have an everlasting... Have you noticed that God's vision for Abraham gets bigger and bigger and not smaller and smaller? You know, could you imagine, just just put yourself just for a second in Abraham's position. Just for just one second. I want you to think about this. God shows up and says, I'm going to give you lots of kids. You go, amen. Lots of kids sounds great. I'm I'm 75. That that sounds great. I'm, I'm cool with lots of kids. Right? And then all, then 10 years go by, no kids. 15 years go by, no kids. Right? And, and in 15 years, God's like, hey, I just want to let you know, it's going to be incredible! 10 more years go by. God goes, it's going to be more incredible! You know, you're, if you're Abraham, you're thinking to yourself, look, I just bag all the kings and stuff. I need a kid. A kid, I need one kid. Don't need to be father of kings. Don't need all nations. Like all the stars. I get it. I need one. It's got to start with one. I need a kid. One kid. Just one kid. I just need a kid. I just need this. Right? I mean, he's just, and, and he, then he's looking over. He's got like part of the kid that God promised. Like, if only, can't you do something with this? It's not like, But that's how we are, isn't it? We all have our timetable for God. God's on a timer. I want to get married and marry somebody I love with my whole heart. And then we turn like 30 and we're like, maybe I wasn't clear, God. Um, What I was saying was, I want to marry somebody I love with my whole heart and they love Jesus and that. And it's like, and then we get to a point where, Whatever we don't believe God's going to be faithful at, the timer goes off. We go, ding, time's up, my turn. Right? Ding, time's up, my turn. And we just started looking around. So what can I make do? What can I make do with? That's how he felt. Isn't that how we feel sometimes? Isn't that how we feel sometimes? Like, well, maybe I should just make do with what's at hand. It's very interesting. Genesis chapter 18. Oh, oh here. I, I don't want to pass this up. You know what's very interesting? 
When we falter in our faith, God does not falter in his faithfulness. Remember that. When we falter in our faith, God is still has greater plans for us. Now we'll go to Genesis 18. Here's what's really funny here. We get Sarah real quick. We're almost done. Seven more scriptures. We're all the way through this thing. Genesis 18, verse 9. God is talking to Abraham and he says, where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said, then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. I want to ask you something. Is anything too hard for God? No, no. Before you say that, though, I want to ask you where your faith is. If God promises you to see, if you seek first the kingdom, that he will completely take care of you, Are you really living a life that seeks first the kingdom? Because it's easy to say, yeah, 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 but here's my special situation. Here's what's going on in my life. But is God, God, you really believe that God is going to take care of you? Because sometimes I think we intellectually, we say the right things, but emotionally, we're really far away from this stuff and the way that we live our lives. You know, I think when I studied the Bible, I got to the point where I'm like, I know God can work in people's lives, but I don't know if I can do it. And I got to the point where I studied all the way through really quick, and I got to the point where I was like, I just, I can't become a Christian. I'll disappoint all these nice people, all this kind of stuff. But there was a point for me where I just had to believe the promise of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation will seize me except for what is common to man. And God is faithful. He won't let me be tempted beyond what I can bear. And he'll always give me a way out to stand up under it. But, you know, for a lot of us, we don't we spend all the time thinking about all the commands that we're not obeying rather than the promises we're not claiming. Because, see, we live our Christianity out of have to. I have to do this. I have to do this or God will be upset. I have to do this or I'll fall under judgment. I have to do this or I can't call myself a Christian. I have to. But, you know, do we really want to live our lives in have to's? I don't want to. I don't want to be. I don't want to be a have to Christian. I want to be a want to Christian. But if we ever lose sight of God's promises, we become have to Christians, and not want to Christians. You know, God's destiny for Abraham was for the whole world to be blessed through his family, and here he is, a hundred years old, and he still doesn't have one. You know, it's very interesting. He has to want to believe that God is going to do everything that he said. Now, here's what's really crazy is we get to Genesis chapter 22, and what happens? God did everything he said he was going to do, right? God came through. God delivered. You know, it, it's really funny. It's like you, you, re, you read Genesis chapter 22. She has a baby. It's Isaac. They have it. All nations. We know, we know how the story ends, right? Jacob becomes Israel. It becomes the father of many nations. Jesus comes from it. It's an incredible thing. And and look, look at Hebrews chapter 11 here. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God... Te- oh, excuse me. I've got to go back. Okay, go to Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 1, he gets the son. I almost skipped to the end there. Genesis chapter 22, here's his faith is tested again. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said, Abraham, here I am, he, said, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love... And go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I, go, uh, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. It was very interesting. Have you ever thought about how when God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he actually negotiated with God? 
It's like if there's 15 people, if there's 10 people, if there's five people. It was very interesting where his faith was after seeing his son born was there was no negotiation. He just believed. Like after seeing the miracle, he just believed. You know, I think when we come back to this aspect of his, his faith after seeing what God did, it, it, was, it was amazing. I love, that's the scripture we're going to go to. Is, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. You know what's funny? When we're doing great in our faith, we find reasons to believe God. And when we are not strong in our faith, we, ha- we find excuses not to believe. Where are you at this morning? Are you finding reasons to believe in the promises of God, to be inspired that God is going to work in incredible ways? I love this because as the family evangelist, as the family minister in Denver, like it, the plan that God started with was that the whole earth would be Blessed through a family. Through our families. Through moms and dads and teens and college students living together where they were believing the promises of God. And that through that, that might be a light to the world so they might trust in a God who raises the dead. That they might trust in a God who loves them and believes in them and has a plan even for them. Because that's what God said. He said, he didn't just tell Abraham, you'll be blessed. He said, you'll be blessed so that you can be a blessing. I'm going to take care of you so that you can take care of everybody else. So all nations can be blessed through you. But sometimes when our faith is not in a good place, we forget that our promises from God are not just for us. That we're called as Christians to be blessed and protected by God, which is true. But not so that we can be blessed and protected, but so that we can be a blessing and a protector for others. The church is supposed to be a refuge for the hurting and the harassed. I'll leave you with one parting thought as we think about Abraham and his faith this morning. Did you notice that Abraham's faith flourished the older he got? Why is it that I see people who claim to be Christians, the older they get, the less chances they take? Their faith doesn't flourish. It seems to fade. It seems they're looking for a good plane to settle on rather than one more adventure to go on. You know, I think I love the teens because the teens, they're fired up about everything. And when they become Christians, there's something when you look at them and you go, man, the teens are awesome. The campus is awesome. They, I mean, look, they want to go one year challenge. They're going to China. They're going to go all of those kind of places. They're going to do all those kind of things. Let me tell you something. Abraham did his most radical act of faith at a hundred. At a hundred. Now, I just need to know, is there anybody here that's over a hundred? Okay, so none of you are exempt. None of you are exempt from radical acts of faith. But when's the last time that the, the more mature disciples in the church led the way in blow away faith, in giving, in evangelism, in radicalness? When's the last time someone said, I can't wait to retire so that I can go on the mission field overseas? Where are the Caleb's? I love Caleb in the Bible because he was really old guy. He was like 85 years old. And they got into the promised land and all the young guys were like, this area is too hard for us. Caleb goes, did I'll take that land. I'll show you whippersnappers how to beat up people for the Lord. You, need, you have a challenge. You have something you think can't be done. Let me tell you something. I've seen enough of God. I've seen enough of God's faithfulness that nothing will stand in the way of my faith. I'm going to tell you something. If we're going to build a generational church, then it doesn't start with the teens. It doesn't start in kingdom kids. It's what they see in you. That's where the revolution starts. It's not in a curriculum. It's when they see a kingdom kid teacher who might be 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, but still has great faith in a great God. That's what transforms a generational 
church. Are you guys with me? I'll leave you with this thought. When we falter in our faith, God never falters in his faithfulness. God's greatest dreams and plans for your life are still ahead of you. Whether it was to become a Christian or to get married, your greatest plans are still ahead of you. The question is, will you focus on God's promise and your faith? I hope you'll do that today. Amen.